Well, good morning, House of Praise family. Pastor Steve here on this thirsty Thursday morning. Uh, what a beautiful day this is, and God's going to give us a wonderful day today. I know that you're going to be blessed as well. We're excited about our online Thirsty Thursday study tonight. We're going to get into the book of Romans. We're going to be having an incredible Bible study, uh, starting a Bible study on the book of Romans uh, today. And we're excited about that because God is showing us so many good things. And this is a powerful book. But before we get into that, we're going to watch a little introductory video. Take a quick look at this. Be blessed and I'll be right back. Paul's letter to the Romans. It's one of the longest and most significant things ever written by the man who was formerly known as Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jewish rabbi belonging to a group known as the Pharisees, and he was passionate and devout to the Torah of Moses and the traditions of Israel. And he saw Jesus and his followers as a threat. But then he had a radical encounter with the risen Jesus, who commissioned him as an apostle, like an official representative, to the world of non-Jewish people called Gentiles in the Bible. And so he started going by his Roman name, Paul, and he traveled all around the ancient Roman Empire telling people about the risen King Jesus and forming his followers then into these new communities called churches. And Paul would occasionally write letters to these new Jesus communities to help them foster their faith or answer questions. And the book of Romans is one of these. It was actually written quite late in his career. Now, we know from the book of Acts that the church in Rome had existed for some time, that it was made up of Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. But at one point, the Roman emperor Claudius had expelled all of the Jewish people from Rome. And then about five years later, all of those Jews, including Jesus-following Jews, were allowed to return. And when they did, they found a church that had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. And so this created lots of tension, so that by Paul's day, the Roman church was divided. People disagreed about how to follow Jesus. They were debating about whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate the Sabbath or eat kosher or be circumcised. And so Paul wrote this letter to accomplish a few things. He wanted this divided church to become unified and for a practical purpose. He was hoping that the Roman church could become a staging ground for his mission to go even further west all the way to Spain. And so these circumstances are what motivated Paul to write out his fullest explanation of the gospel, the good news that he was announcing about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Now, the letter is designed to have four main movements, but it's unified as one long-flowing exploration of the gospel. The gospel, Paul says, first of all, reveals God's righteousness, and then it also creates a new humanity, which fulfills God's promise to Israel. And so it's this gospel that's going to unify the church. In this video, we're just going to explore the ideas in chapters 1 through 4. So Paul opens by introducing himself as an apostle appointed by God to spread the gospel about Jesus, how he's the Messiah of Israel who was raised from the dead as the Son of God, King of the nations. And Jesus now calls all humanity to come under his loving rule. And Paul says this good news about King Jesus is, first of all, God's power to save people who trust in him, and second, that it reveals God's righteousness. Now, Righteousness is a rich Old Testament word for Paul. It describes God's character, that he always does justice, what is right and what is good, but also that he is faithful and just to fulfill his promises. And Paul's saying that the story of Jesus shows how God has done both of these things. How? Well, he goes first into a long creative retelling of Genesis chapters 3 through 11. He shows how all the Gentile world, all the nations, have become trapped in the spiral of sin and selfishness. The human heart and mind are broken, Paul says. We've turned away from God to embrace idolatry, which means finding ultimate significance in created things and then giving ultimate allegiance to these things that are not God. This results in a distortion of our humanity and destructive behavior. And so what's left is a humanity that stands guilty as charged before a just and righteous God. To which the people of Israel might say, well, it's a good thing then that God chose our people out from among the nations. He saved us out of slavery in Egypt. He gave us the laws of the Torah, like the Sabbath and eating kosher and circumcision. And these all together show us how to live as God's holy people. 
But, Paul says, not so fast. He recalls the storyline of the Torah and of the rest of the Old Testament, which shows that Israel was just as sinful and idolatrous and morally broken as the rest of humanity. Israel is actually more guilty than the Gentiles, Paul says, because they have the Torah. They should know better. And so, Paul concludes, all humanity, Gentiles, Israelites, are hopelessly trapped and guilty before God. But that is not the final word. The good news about Jesus is God's response. Instead of holding humanity guilty, Jesus came as Israel's Messiah to die on behalf of all people as a sacrifice for sins. As our representative, Jesus took into himself all of the just consequences of the pain, the sin, and the death that we have caused in the world. And he overcame it all by his resurrection from the dead. It's his new resurrection life that he makes available to others. Jesus became what we are so that we might become what he is. And all of this, Paul says, is how God justifies those who trust or have faith in Jesus. Now, justification is another rich Old Testament term for Paul, and it's related to God's righteousness. It literally means to declare righteous. Because of what Jesus did on our behalf, we are given a new status before God. Instead of finding us guilty, God declares that a person is in a right relationship with him and is forgiven. Justification results in a new family. The person who trusts in Jesus is given a place among God's covenant people. Justification also results in a new future, which begins a journey of life transformation by God's grace. And so all of these things about justification are God's gift to those who through their faith are in Christ. And so this leads Paul in chapter 4 to explore the huge implications that all of this has for who can be a part of God's covenant family. He goes back to the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Before any of the laws of the Torah were given to Israel, Abraham was justified or declared righteous before God. How? Well, God promised that Abraham would become a father of a large multi-ethnic family that would receive God's blessing. But he and his wife Sarah, they were really old. They had never been able to have children. But nonetheless, Abraham had radical faith and trust in God's promise. And so God declared him to be righteous. And so Paul says, now Abraham has become the father of God's new covenant family, and it's spreading all around the world. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles who have the same kind of faith and trust in the one who fulfilled God's promise to Abraham, Jesus the Messiah. So let's pause and summarize Paul's main ideas here in chapters 1 through 4, because they're the foundation for understanding the rest of the letter. All humanity is hopelessly trapped in sin and needs to be rescued. That rescue, however, is not going to happen by people trying to obey the laws of the Torah. Rather, God's righteous character has moved him to rescue the world through Jesus' death and resurrection so that he could create that multi-ethnic family of Abraham based on faith as his own new covenant people. And so Paul's going to go on to show how this new family is a part of something much, much bigger that calls them to a whole new way of life together. But it's all going to be rooted in these core ideas explored in chapters 1 through 4 of Paul's letter to the Romans. Wasn't that awesome? That is an incredible work of art, isn't it? And, uh, and it really gives us a good idea, a good introductory feel for the book. And uh, we'll come back with another one maybe in a week or two as well. It's a really good tool. So God bless you on that. I'd like to get right into the study now in this outline of the book of Romans. Uh, you know, obviously known as the book of justification by faith. And uh, this book is considered to be uh, the most basic, the most uh, comprehensive uh, statement of true Christianity. The Apostle Paul uses so many good things. He actually refers back to a lot of Old Testament examples, which is really powerful. And actually, Martin Luther was the, so affected by the book of Romans back in, in the 15th century. Martin Luther described the book of Romans as the chief part of the New Testament and the very purest gospel. And it affected him and uh, what he did, and which led to the Great Reformation, as we know, and, and changed the view of Christianity forever. And uh, so thank God for Martin Luther and how God did use him at that time in that very special task. Uh, Romans is a very powerful theological writing as well. 
uh, Paul's purposes in writing the book is actually threefold. Number one, it was to address a heretical view of the gospel and to establish that salvation is by faith alone. Salvation is by faith alone. And it, that view of the gospel was crucial. And he had revelation of that like no one else, even more so than Peter. In fact, Peter actually wrote in his epistle at one point but that the writings of Paul were, were like difficult to understand. They were incredible. They actually had more light and understanding on this issue than the other apostles. Number two, uh, he was asserting his apostolic authority as well. And he does uh, have a lot to say about that in this book. And then number three, resolving doctrinal differences between the Jew and the Gentile. And that was a huge issue because the church obviously was a messianic church and uh, it was a church made up of Jews. And then Paul had this incredible assignment from God to go out and to preach to the Gentiles and to go to areas where Christ was never named. So the Apostle Paul was called to be an apostle to the Gentiles and defines the gospel as the power of God for salvation and the revealer of righteousness of God. And uh, he wanted to address the things that were going on in the church that were not right. And uh, of course, that had to be addressed. Both Jew and Greek are justified by faith. Doesn't matter, okay? And we'll get into that more as we get into this Where? book. They are declared righteous, and the believer is sanctified through identification with Christ, with Jesus Christ. Uh, Israel is sovereignly set aside for a time to allow Gentiles to be saved. And uh, that's amazing because, uh, you know, Christ came to his own, but his own received him not. That's what it says in Scripture. The Apostle Paul approached the Jews first as well. And at some point where he was so rejected, he said, I turn to the Gentiles. Gentiles meaning non-Jews of all sorts. In, in this particular culture, it was a Greek world. God had a plan for Paul that was most incredible. He was not aware of it when he first had his first encounter. He had an encounter with God when he was actually on his way to the city of Damascus, and he had authority to, to persecute more Christians. And uh, he was a persecutor of Christians in the early church. Not a nice person. Not a good person at all, even though he had all this religious background. He was highly educated, no doubt was wealthy, well-known, well-respected in the Pharisee community. But then he had this incredible revelation, as we know. We're not going to get into that, but he had this encounter with Jesus himself along the roadway. And that's what uh, was the transformation of Paul in a very, very big way. And we'll get into that on another study. But the theme of this book is truly the righteousness of God. Section one, the revealer of righteousness. And of course, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what we're going to focus on here. Gospel simply means good news, okay? It simply means good news. Paul confirms his calling as an apostle, identifies and prays for the recipients of this letter and states his obligation to preach the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And this is really important, not based on the works of the law, not based on anything we can do, but based on what Jesus Christ has already done. And of course, he identifies the theme of this book. And we're going to actually start in Romans, the first chapter, and the first 17 verses is really where we're going to focus now here on this Bible study. So I hope you have your Bibles open. I hope you have a notepad and pen so that we can go through this together and be really blessed on this online Thirsty Thursday. Then he offered a prayer. Paul prays for the Roman believers and seeking God's will and visiting uh, them. He was excited about his visit. He had a stop, obviously, first in, in Jerusalem, drop off all that money from that collection for the poor. And then he was going to head to Spain, but on the way to Spain, stop at Rome. Now, in Romans 1, 8 to 12, we're going to go there next. Okay, Paul expresses his thankfulness to God and for the reputation of the Romans' faith and he was going to compliment them for that, whom he faithfully prays for every day, 
and for God's will in visiting them. It was really important to him that he would visit them. Let's go now to Romans 1, and we'll read 8 to 10, verses 8 to 10. Let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all of my heart and by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. Boy, he really wanted to see the saints in Rome. Paul actually longed to see uh, the saints in Rome, and even though his previous efforts uh, were thwarted and it didn't work out, in order to impart a spiritual gift, receive fruit, and be mutually encouraged. So that's what his goal was. Now let's go to Romans 1, 11 and 12. For I long to visit you so that I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. And when we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith so that I will also be able to encourage you and you will encourage me. It'll be a, a mutual encouragement. And he mentions that again. Now, there's an obligation that Paul mentions in the next section here. Paul states his obligation to preach the gospel to all people and his eagerness to preach the gospel in Rome. And uh, let's go now to the 14th and 15th verses. That's Romans 1, 14 and 15. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and to the uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome too, to preach the gospel. And the theme of the gospel that I want to bring you, he says here in the 16th and 17th verses, because it is God's power for the salvation of Jews and Greeks, okay? No different between the Jews and the Greeks. Paul was unashamed of the gospel. Now let's read now in verse 16 out of Romans 1. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. And this is an incredible thing. Got to remember, got to remember the Jews were hung up on having Jewish tradition and holding on to Jewish tradition. And there was some confusion in the Greek churches because the Jews obviously wanted to hold on to some of the traditions that they had. And then Paul had come with this incredible different message that it's not necessary. We're saved by faith alone apart from the works of the law. So it was really important that he drive this subject home in this letter. Okay, we're still in the section called the theme. Number two, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God from the beginning of faith to its conclusion because those who are righteous live by faith. Now let's go to the 17th verse, Romans 1 in your Bibles, verse 17. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. God, by the work of what Jesus did on the cross, made us right with him. We were reconciled based on what Christ did, not based on anything that we can bring to the table, so to speak. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Now we're going to go into the second section of this study, and uh, I'm gonna call it section two, uh, Roman numeral two, if you will, and uh, the rejection of righteousness, unbelief. Now, the Apostle Paul addresses some very strong points in this first chapter, in this first part of his letter, as he writes this letter to the Roman church. Paul contrasts the suppression of truth of the unrighteous and the stubbornness of self-righteousness. He does address some things here that are very, very strong. And uh, some Christians are aware of this. And, and I've talked with many Christians that aren't even aware of what Paul addresses here in the very front end of this letter to the Romans. And of course, the unbelief of the Jew and the sinfulness of everyone involved is all addressed here. And it's it's in a section of Romans 1, and it goes right on actually through the third chapter. But we're just going to read a, a small portion of that here at this time. 
Okay, section A is the unrighteous, and of course, God abandons the unrighteous to their own lust because they reject revealed truth. And uh, the, the Holy Spirit is addressing the sinfulness of sin in this letter, okay? And I know that's an uncomfortable approach. A lot of people, I know we were taught in the church that we grew up in, Carol and I, uh, we were taught about the sinfulness of sin. And of course, and I know that if you're really focusing on the grace of God, which we should, then that can almost look like we're sin-focused, and that's not really at all what we're saying. We've got to remember, uh, we, we need to understand the sinfulness of sin, but yet the righteousness that the Holy Spirit brings us into supernaturally, it's imputed righteousness. And that's talked about a lot in the book of Hebrews, imputed righteousness. In other words, it's put on us supernaturally by a work of, of Father God, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's go into Romans 1 now. We're going to read uh, 18 and 19, verses 18 and 19. God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful and wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And they know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. He has made it obvious to them. Since creation, God's essence has been visible, so all are without excuse for not honoring and thanking God, becoming futile in their imaginations, and they have a darkened heart. And now, in the, in the world that we live in today, can you relate to this? Got to remember, this was written maybe 2,000 years ago, and it was obvious then of course, it's a different culture today. We're in a different situation today, of course, but but it's it's so obvious even today. Uh, futile in imaginations and a darkened heart, and yes, that does exist today when we think of the great sins even of our nation, as we have talked about recently. Now, let's go to Romans 1 and verse 20 now. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities and his eternal power and divine nature. Isn't that a beautiful way of putting this? So they have no excuse for not knowing God. They have no excuse. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, it says here. And we're going to go down now to Romans 1, 21 to 23. Just keep following me now. We're at 21 and 23. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they began to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. And boy, I'll tell you, that's something we can even relate to today even more so. Verse number 22, claiming to be wise, they instead became what? Utter fools verse number 23, and instead of worshiping the glorious ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people or birds or animals or reptiles. Imagine that. Of course, idol worship was, 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 a, was a key problem. Now, idol worship is different in today's culture. The idols of today are fame and money and, uh, you know, uh, uh, television, the internet, and, and so many things that are very different in our culture. So idols today are very different than what he was referring to, but nonetheless still idols and still considered idolatry. Now God allowed the lust of their hearts to become impure and their bodies to be dishonored. Now think about this now, okay? God was watching this and he was, he was observing what was happening here dishonoring their bodies because they rejected God's uh, truth and they chose a lie. Now let's go to Romans 1 and 24 and 25. We're at the 24th and 25th verse step. So God abandoned them to do whatever shameful things their heart desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. This is incredible how this is addressed right here in this first chapter. And they traded the truth about God for a lie, so they worshiped and served the things that God created instead of the creator himself who is worthy of eternal praise, amen. 
Now you can see where the Apostle Paul's going here. He's saying that this unrighteousness had to be dealt with. Now we know that God already has a plan. He already has everything in place so that this can be easily removed. But obviously, people still, even, even after they accept Christ sometimes, still continue in sin. And he addresses that in a later chapter here in this book of Romans. God permitted them to have the degrading passions of unnatural and indecent lust. And uh, it's going to address homosexuality here now. Let's go into Romans 1 and 26 and 27. That's why it's so important that we understand what's going on in our nation and the things that have been so accepted and even taught in our public schools and about transgender and homosexuality is accepted, same-sex marriage, and this is great sins of our nation. Great sins of our nation. Now let's go to verse number 26 and 27. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural ways to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Women with women, men with men. This is addressing homosexuality and the great abomination and great sin that this is. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty that they deserved. Now, the Apostle Paul didn't pull any punches here, did he? He didn't pull any punches. He went right for the jugular, so to speak, because he knew that he had a responsibility to address what was wrong. Verse number 28 to 30. And since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness and sin, greed and hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior and gossip. Now we're at verse 30. They are backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and of course, boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, break their promises and they're heartless and have no mercy. Verse number 32, they know God's justice requires that those who do such things deserve to die and yet they do them anyway. Worst yet, they encourage others to do them also. Well, this wraps up the first chapter here in the book of Romans. And uh, the Apostle Paul, like I said, didn't pull any punches at all. He went right for the details of what had to be addressed. And of course, this book is about salvation. It's about justification by faith. It's about, you know, being victorious over sin. So right on the very front end of his letter, he addresses a lot of really, really evil issues that had to be addressed. The letter was to the Romans. So I say there's a very good chance that some of this had even crept into the church. So he's simply saying that, yes, sin, the sinfulness of sin is something that has to be addressed. And believe me, those who ignore God, those who refuse to receive the salvation that is available by faith, they will be punished and there will be a time of reckoning. However, God is offering victory, breakthrough, healing, and, and a complete reconciliation to Father God based on what Christ has done. So as we get into this book a little bit more, it's going to be incredible. So I know the first chapter was a little bit heavy here, but I just know that God wants us to know and understand what's in the book of Romans so that we can address it properly and, uh, and be well aware of what the word of God is and the will of God through the word of God. Amen. God bless you all, and uh, we'll see you next time. God bless. Bye-bye.